Puzzles are an important part of the games that I tend to like. Usually I can find games with either a good story or good puzzles. Not both, or at least not consistently. However, there are a few that I recall that have met the mark. One of these is Ghost Trick Phantom Detective. Ghost Trick is a puzzle-focused mystery game centering around an amnesiac ghost trying to recover his memories while unraveling the secrets behind a murder case. This game is criminally underrated. Capcom included Ghost Trick as a contributor to low sales in 2010, meaning not all that many people have actually played it. Thankfully, it's being brought back into the public eye. A remastered version is coming to all major platforms in June of 2023, making it easily accessible on modern hardware. I figured this would be the perfect game to talk about to celebrate the sudden jump to 20,000 subscribers. The protagonist wakes up. When he opens his eyes, he sees three things. A woman in a yellow coat, a man with a gun, and a dead body. A dead body he suspects to be his own. After all, do you see any other corpses around here? Just as he accepts the fact that he cannot do anything, a voice calls out from nearby, claiming he's the only one who can save her. The world morphs around him, tinging everything red. This is the ghost world, the land of the dead. The protagonist, who we'll call the man in red for now, demands an identity from the voice. The voice tells him that there's no time for that and that he needs to use his powers of the dead to save the woman in yellow. This blue flame is the man in red's soul. That white dot with a blue aura nearby is a core. Many objects have cores, allowing those with the powers of the dead to interact with them. The man in red moves his soul from the corpse to the core of a nearby crossing gate. Now, it's time to use a ghost trick. Before the gunman can pull the trigger, the man in red returns to his normal view of the world and manipulates the crossing guard upwards to temporarily disorient the assailant. He moves to another core. It would have been helpful to use the wrecking ball, but his ghost powers have a limited reach. He strums the guitar instead, distracting the gunman again and allowing the woman in yellow to run slightly further away. The man in red gets an idea. If he can manipulate objects, why not manipulate his own body? Upon trying this, his ghost tricks have no effect. It seems he can only manipulate non-living things. And unfortunately, time has run out. The woman in the yellow coat has been shot dead. The gunman kicks the red-coated corpse out of the way and answers the phone. He reports back to base, tips his hat at the corpse, and leaves. Suddenly, a desk lamp begins to move on its own. Before we continue the story overview, we need to talk about the music. From this point forward, I'll be using almost exclusively music from this game because it's incredible. It's the embodiment of what a DS soundtrack should be. I've used it in videos in the past and will continue to use it in the future. The man in red begins to speak to the lamp, realizing that this is the source of the voice from earlier. The lamp was essentially beaming his thoughts directly into the man in red's head. Another ghost trick. There's still lingering frustration at not being able to save the woman, but the lamp quickly explains more about the powers of the dead. Flickering to the ghost world, the man maneuvers through the junk surrounding him, using his newfound ghost tricks to create new paths. This leads him close enough to see that the woman has a core with a yellow glow. The lamp explains that the man in red is special. Not everyone who dies gets these powers of the dead. The man very clearly does not have the ability to manipulate the corpse, but the lamp insists he try again anyway. He's whisked away to a swirling red void. The woman's soul is present but unconscious. The man is informed of a new power then the ability to save the dead. When a corpse is less than a day old, he can interact with it to be sent four minutes before the death in order to use his ghost tricks to save them. The man in red reverses time. In the past, the woman crouches over his corpse, concerned, before the gunman arrives spouting off nonsense about eliminating all knowledge of something called Temsic. From here, we witness the events as they unfolded moments ago, with the man in red using the crossing gate and guitar as a distraction but still failing to save the woman. Now, it's time to use his ghost tricks to change this outcome. This is how most puzzles in this game will work. The man in red is at the bottom of the junkyard, having appeared where the woman's core originally lay. He dashes through the junk to get upstairs, doing things like turning on a fan to blow a flag in its rope to the right, then using a blender to grab the rope and pull the flag upwards. He moves to the bicycle and rings the bell as yet another distraction. The gunman shoots the bike, lowering the front wheel to the ground and allowing the man in red to pedal forwards. He takes control of a crane and uses a wrecking ball to take out the hitman. Thankfully, cartoon physics apply. With a life newly saved, the man in red begins to realize something about his own life. He doesn't remember any of it. Not a thing. His name, his past, the circumstances surrounding his death, they are all a complete mystery. The lamp reveals his own name to be Ray, as in a ray of light in the darkness. The man in red calls Ray on using a fake name, but Ray mentions that he hasn't been given a name either. 
The man in red reveals his newfound lack of memories. Ray explains that some ghosts take longer to recover their past memories. It doesn't really matter in the end. After all, all ghosts disappear alongside the sunrise. This means that our protagonist essentially has 12 hours to figure out who he is before he completely ceases to exist. He would use his ghost tricks to try and prevent his own death, but according to Ray, it won't work on himself. With the desire to figure out who he is and a time limit ticking down in the background, the man in red makes his way towards the woman to try and gather some more information. She seemingly witnessed his death, so she should have some kind of clue. Ray makes it very clear that the woman is the key to unraveling all the events of tonight. Navigating from the power lines, the man in red drops an umbrella down to the woman. She seems distressed after seeing so much start moving seemingly by itself. Maybe she has psychokinetic powers? She walks down to where the body fell as a cat runs away. She grabs a note from the coat pocket, but before the man in red can read it, she puts it away. A phone rings in the background. The same phone that the hitman picked up earlier to report back to his boss. This is the perfect chance to gather intel on who wants him dead. The man who seems to be the boss picks up but quickly apologizes when the woman answers instead of who he expects, and he hangs up the phone. The man in red is informed by Ray that he can travel through the phone lines using his powers of the dead, although Ray cannot follow. Ray wants the man to get to the bottom of all the mysterious events happening over town tonight to try and find out the truth. In so, the man in red will supposedly learn about himself as well. I absolutely adore this setup. It shows you the basics of the gameplay and sets up a story with just enough information to make me want more. And it's right within the grasp of the people that ordered the man in red to hit being right on the other side of the phone line. I want to know who the man in red is and why he has no memories. I want to know his name so I can stop saying the mouthful, the man in red. I want to know who ordered the hit on both him and the woman he saved. I want to know about Ray and why he seems to only stay inside a lamp. But most importantly, I think the concept behind the puzzles themselves is incredible and I really want to try more. If you have any interest in this game whatsoever while you're watching, feel free to stop at any point and come back later. The remaster is coming out very soon and the internet is very open about how easy it is to hack a DS nowadays. I'll make sure to give a clear warning before we get to the real spoiler heavy stuff. Now let's get to it. On the other side of the phone line sits the boss, the one who had the man in red killed. He's looking through the woman's file and talking about how she could interfere with their plans and needs to be dealt with. Apparently, her name is Lynn. After hearing them speak, the man in red has no doubts that these men are assassins. This room is incredibly high-tech. From hidden projectors to automatically reversible tables, there's a lot going on here. By using his ghost tricks, the man in red messes with the projector until the image is changed to something else. A photo of himself. This is where we learn that his name is Sissel. The boss and his assistant seem to have big plans tonight. The phone rings with the assassins remarking that the Lynn problem must have been solved. The assistant sent another hitman to her apartment to take her out. Sissel navigates to the phone to listen in. This is where the humor really starts to shine for the first time. The developers added a lot of funny scenes, but they never overstay their welcome. There are lots of small things, like the hitman named One Step Ahead Tango getting ahead of himself and talking about promotion and salary raises before the job is even done. Lynn hasn't returned to her apartment yet, but a little girl living with her has been tied up, and their dog has been shot. Sissel quickly connects to the dog's core to try and bring him back to life. Here we learn that the dog's name is Missile, and he's adorable! This little guy is super enthusiastic and loyal to a fault. We learn that the dead can travel together as Missile talks Sissel's ear off during the entire puzzle. I'm only going to go in depth on a few of the puzzles, but keep in mind that every single level in this game is incredibly well done. Sissel uses a cabinet to knock a rat under the couch, luring past Missile underneath. He barks, luring the little girl Camila underneath as well. This is just in time to avoid the hitman's entry. Missile seems sad that he doesn't have the abilities of the dead, but there's not really much we can do about it. He promises that he'll never forget Sissel, which is going to be easier than initially thought considering he still has a core after being brought back. Apparently, people who die and are conscious while being saved will retain their cores, allowing them to communicate with those who saved them. The hitman is informed that Lynn is still at the junkyard, so he heads out to cut her off. Camila receives a call from Lynn, asking her to retrieve an old music box and meet her at a restaurant called The Chicken Kitchen. Sissel knocked the box out of the ceiling during the last puzzle, so it's just a matter of drawing her attention to it. Camila leaves to meet Lynn. Sissel would follow, but there was collateral damage after that phone call. The phone is no longer functional, so Sissel will have to find one elsewhere. Fortunately, there's a way to make a path to the next room. Sissel turns on the TV, prompting Missile to start barking at it. This causes the wine mom next door to get pissed and start punching the wall, knocking a picture frame off alongside the lamp from earlier. 
This creates a path into her apartment and hopefully to a new phone. Sissel bids Missile adieu and moves to the other apartment as Missile tries to create his own path in the only way he knows how. In the Wine Mom's apartment, she uses a typewriter to write a romance story. After hearing some of the excerpts, maybe this isn't the greatest thing to be reading aloud next to her sick daughter. Thankfully, there's a phone next to the bed. Cecil overhears a conversation between mother and daughter. It's the father's birthday, but no celebration is planned. The mother took the daughter and moved out for conflicting reasons. The daughter calls her mom on being selfish and asks to go home, but she's completely ignored. The phone rings with the father on the line. He begs for her to return, but the wine mom is incredibly stubborn and a little bit insane. It's not a little bit, she's nuts. She refuses to let him even talk to their daughter, despite objections from all other parties, hanging up the phone and getting back to work. Sissel returns to the junkyard. There are two detectives and a coroner near his body next to Ray giving us a cute little dance. He informs Sissel that Lynn was taken into custody. As it turns out, Lynn is a rookie detective. Not only that, she's been arrested for Sissel's murder. Moments later, a flamboyant man in a white coat arrives on the scene. He literally dances down the stairs to speak with the detectives. This is Inspector Cabanella, a smooth, confident, and capable detective, as well as the head of the Special Investigation Unit. After confirming the situation, he makes a phone call to check in on a detective participating in a stakeout from a park. An eccentric man picks up the phone claiming to be the guardian of the park, but the receiver is snatched away by the intended recipient. Cabanella learns that Lynn is in custody in the junkyard superintendent's office, and decides to pay her a visit to learn more about what's going on. Soon after, a gunshot rings out, and the detectives downstairs get a call from Cabanella, demanding the doctor's presence. Cecil tags along, finding Lynn's corpse for the second time that night. It seems the hitman from her apartment wasn't playing around. A scientist with a pigeon on his head says that the shot came from one of the piles of garbage outside. Sissel connects to Lynn's core. She's conscious this time and can actually hold a conversation. She tells Sissel that even though they met that night, it was at his request. They didn't know each other beforehand. Sissel asks if she will help him learn about himself, but she can't make any promises. The only thing Lynn remembers is that she thinks she was working on a pretty important case tonight, so that's her first priority. Her honesty prompts Sissel to trust her, and the two go four minutes into the past to save her life. Lynn was shot through the window by a hitman, so Sissel needs to get outside in order to interfere. When he's in the past trying to save someone, Sissel doesn't have free reign over the phone lines. He can only travel across them when they're actively being used. Thankfully, the officer in charge of watching Lynn gets a call from the detectives outside. After some clever light manipulation lures the hitman into position, Sissel drops a pallet on his head. He's probably fine. Now that Lynn is alive, Sissel makes his way back to the building. He finds that Lynn has somehow managed to escape custody. The officer watching her made the observation that she made a phone call while looking at her notebook. They look through it and call a circled phone number. It connects to a phone manned by an officer named Bailey at a specialized prison. I love Officer Bailey. He's such an energetic and charming guy and his animations are incredible. Suddenly, Bailey gets a second call, but this time it's from Lynn. She wants to talk to him, although we don't know who that is. She isn't able to, as the call room has already been reserved. Cecil moves back to her location, finding that she's somehow dead once again, this time in the basement of the superintendent's office. But things are different this time. She was in a locked room, alone. I don't think I can do this justice with a description, so let's take a look at how Lynn died this time. That's right, a machine murdered her this time around. This may seem like it'll make things more complicated, but Cecil can now manipulate the parts of the killer itself. Using a well-timed swing, Cecil uses a ball to turn the Cupid doll that starts the fuse towards some streamers, setting those off instead. Now that Lynn is alive again, Cecil takes a moment to talk with her. It seems her memories have fully returned, and he has some questions. Lynn didn't see who shot him. She's investigating a murder case on her own, and Cecil supposedly had information for her. She firmly believes that the accused is innocent and will stop at nothing to prove it. She can't provide any more information than that. They come to the agreement to help each other out whenever possible. Lynn leaves to meet Camila at the chicken kitchen, leaving only one request. 
Sissel is to sneak into the special prison from earlier and check on prisoner D99's schedule. Sissel gets to the prison and hears the guards talking about each prisoner. One was in a band and started a song like normal, but the lyrics were national secrets. Another took over a police department and pointed a flamethrower at the commissioner. He then demanded curry, ate it, and torched the place when it was too spicy. Finally is prisoner D99, who killed his own wife. Sissel makes his way through the prison, where the prisoners have a very odd escape plan. The musician has two types of notes, one with circles and one with X's. The curry lover has a hook in his toilet that will catch these notes when flushed down the toilet and ring a bell. When he gets one with a circle, he starts digging a tunnel behind his toilet. When he gets an X, he stops and hides the tunnel. Sissel uses these notes to travel to the cells on the lower floor. He makes his way to prisoner D99's cell to find out what the blackboard says. The prisoner is a large bearded man who seems to have an affinity for painting. As Cecil looks for the schedule, he notes that the board usually containing it is completely blank. As Cecil tries to leave, D99 is delivered dinner. He moves his painting out of the way, revealing its contents. A familiar looking man in a red suit. This is the perfect time to talk about forced perspective, which the creators used expertly. They hid this massive reveal right in front of our faces for the entirety of this level. The devs use variations of this trick in the future and it remains interesting each and every time. Cecil retreats to find Lin and talk to her about his discoveries. He takes a detour as Bailey gets a call from headquarters. Something seems to be taking place at the prison in one hour. Cabanella hops on the phone, claiming that he knows about Lin's earlier phone call. Next time Bailey gets a call, he's to tell the inspector right away. With one last chipper threat leveled, Sizzle redirects himself to the headquarters phone to gather more intel. Here, the chief is being shown some security camera footage from the junkyard. It is very incriminating. Lin clearly shot Sissel in this tape, but that's not all it shows. It clears up an inconsistency from earlier. How is Sissel's body on the lower level if the hitman wasn't there to kick him down? As it turns out, Sissel had a little friend in his case. Alarms begin blaring and the detective in charge of the stakeout radios in. Lin appeared at point X, which is apparently the chicken kitchen. A sudden crash echoes over the speakers and the detective stops responding. Sissel needs to get over there now. Thankfully, Cabanella makes a call to the establishment to try and find more information. After traveling across the phone lines, it looks like the detective from the park crashed his surveillance van into the restaurant. Sissel enters the ghost world to find a second corpse, this one underneath a massive chicken that used to be suspended from the ceiling. It seems that Lin is dead again. Now these two need to have a talk. Sissel reveals that he saw footage of Lin shooting him, as well as the fact that it was right after he gave her some kind of information. Lin is panicking, since she still remembers none of this occurring. Sissel also tells her of D99's blank schedule. This apparently means that the prisoner's execution will be carried out very soon. Furthermore, the police chief called the special prison to check in on something happening in an hour. Prisoner D99, Detective Jowd, is set to be executed at 11 p.m. That's not the only new revelation. Apparently, Lin chose the chicken kitchen as her rendezvous point because of the note she took from Sissel's body. It had the location written on it alongside the timestamp 10 p.m., meaning there's a good chance that Sissel is the person being watched for at point X. Despite it all, Sissel still decides to save Lin. If he leaves her to die here, he won't get any any more information, and he needs to find out who he was, even if it means working with his killer. Lin promises to help him find answers. The rewind shows about what you would expect. With no explanation, the surveillance van crashes into the side of the building. Lin pushes a waitress out of the way of the falling chicken, but isn't able to save herself. Sissel maneuvers to the top floor, finding two suspicious-looking individuals carrying a large case. 
The reason they're suspicious is because they're openly talking about the cases from the special prison. Those cases are completely classified, so there's no way these two would have been able to know about them. The tall one supposedly named Beauty gets the sudden sense that someone is eavesdropping, so the duo move to the opposite side of the floor, leaving their case behind. One spilled drink later, Cecil has the waitress noticing the case and informing the owners. He hitches a ride on it to continue eavesdropping, but Beauty gets that sense again. Does she know that we're here? Thankfully, it doesn't seem like it. She burns up what she calls a ladybug on the bone of their chicken. Then, the car slams through the side of the building. Cecil uses the large chicken to maneuver towards the vehicle where he realizes he can go even further back to before the detective's death. Cecil is brought to the stakeout at Tempsick Park. It looks like the detective was on his way to retrieve Lynn when something happened to his headphones, knocking him clean out and causing the accident. Lynn is the one to connect the dots here. The ladybug that Beauty burned must have been a listening device hooked up to the detective's radio. When she destroyed it, it emitted a signal so loud that it knocked him unconscious because he was listening to it through headphones. Now it's time to prevent his death. The detective receives a call from the waitress at the chicken kitchen. She's an undercover agent and the one who placed the bug that started this. Cecil travels over the lines and uses the lazy Susan built into the counter to make sure that the chicken without the listening device is brought to Beauty. Fate has been averted and Cecil wants more information information from Lynn, specifically about the case she's been looking into. Prisoner D-99, Detective Jowd, is Lynn's hero. She was taken hostage by a criminal as a child, and Jowd was the one who saved her. This is why she decided to become a detective in the first place. Five years ago, he was accused of shooting and killing his own wife, but Lynn doesn't believe it for a second. We also learned that Cabanella and Jowd are good friends. Jowd was thorough and analytical, while Cabanella was a natural genius. Because of their connection, Cabanella took Lynn under his wing. He also fudged her exam scores to become a detective, but we're just gonna move past that for now. Lin received the music box from Jowd days after the murder. He must have sent it right before his arrest. She's never been able to get it open, but it clearly contains something important. The stakeout detective, Detective Ringe, confirms Lin's worst fears about the execution. The only way she can stop it is to talk with the Justice Minister, which Cecil agrees to help with. Ringe promises to keep an eye out for Camilla before our pseudo-investigation team heads out. Lin to the Justice Minister's office, and Cecil to the prison. Bailey is doing doing a ridiculous panic dance as the execution has failed. The electric chair that was used malfunctioned after a long time collecting dust. It exploded, killing Jowd anyways, just not through the intended method. Cecil connects to Jowd's core. Jowd doesn't have enough memories to reveal Cecil's identity, so for now, it's time to turn back the clock. Cecil activates the electric chair before Jowd has even entered the room, short-circuiting the electricity. For prisoner safety, all cell doors are unlocked upon a power outage, meaning Cecil and Jowd are about to pull off one hell of an escape. The halls are are crawling with guards wearing night vision goggles and carrying rifles. Jowd seems to have an unusual sixth sense to know Cecil's general location, which we can use to our advantage. Cecil helps Jowd sneak through the prison, climbing through the ceiling and escaping just as the lights are fixed. They part ways temporarily, but are quickly reunited as Jowd calls the guard's office while being held at gunpoint by Cabanella. Cabanella had been on his way to attend the execution when he found a dead man walking. Cecil connects to Jowd's core and he asks some question. Jowd has his memory back, but cannot tell Cecil about how they know each other. This is because Jowd claims he doesn't know Cecil's true face, and he won't speak of anything he isn't sure of. What the hell does he mean by that? Jowd tells Cecil that his best lead will be to get the music box from Lynn's apartment. Cabanella allows Jowd to make a final phone call, a favor from a colleague. He calls the Justice Minister's office to get Cecil to Lynn before being taken into custody by Cabanella. At the Justice Minister's office, things have gone horribly wrong. Lynn arrived to find the minister dead on the ground. As it turns out, this man is the husband of everyone's least favorite wine mom from earlier. It's time to go to four minutes before his death. The minister got a phone call from the couple we saw at the chicken kitchen, telling him that they kidnapped his daughter and will not release her until Jowd is dead. The minister begins to convulse, having some kind of an attack. He knocks his medicine and water away, leading to his untimely demise. At this point, the minister wakes up, hosting his own pity party in the background of our rescue. Now, usually I just go through the very basics of each level because otherwise this video would take far too long, but I'm making an exception here. This is my favorite level in the entire game, and I want to go through it in its entirety. When the minister has his attack, you navigate to the flag to his side and flap it right as his water is about to tumble off the desk, sending it back towards him. Then, you move to the pitcher's core as he lifts it above him to drink. This creates a path to the ceiling fan above him. The water has at least temporarily helped him, but we're going to need that bottle to fully change his fate. Turning the fan into overdrive, you blow a few papers across the room towards the bottle and ride their course. This leads to two suits of armor and some other assorted displays. 
display pieces. You raise the armor's arm to create a path towards the display case above, and knock over one sign. You could knock this melon onto the sword and swing it, but it's not big enough to hit the pill bottle. You head to the curtain and close it, being moved to the other side. Now, you spin the globe on the shelf, knocking it off its stand and pushing a vase to the ground. You knock the other side of the display case down, creating a ramp. We're going to roll the globe onto one end, then move up to the melon from earlier. We use it to knock the other vase down onto the other half of our ramp, turning it into a catapult and launching the globe onto the sword this time. As the globe is larger than the melon, it's now the perfect item to hit that pill bottle over to the minister. With one swing, the deed is done. I love this puzzle for a multitude of reasons. You can knock over five items here, and finding the correct order and location for each item to fall takes serious critical thinking and experimentation. I remember the first time I played this as a kid. I had to take a break and decided to go to bed. I kept thinking about it while falling asleep, and I realized the solution about an hour later, so I solved it in the middle of the night. Lynn brings Cecil over to the desk in the least conspicuous way possible as they get to talking. The minister doesn't believe that Cecil is real, so no one can make headway. They realize that they're going to need to save his daughter in order to revoke that execution order. Cecil travels to the location of the kidnapping, an old apartment. There's a familiar device set up inside, one identical to the contraption that killed Lynn in the locked room. This one is far more disheveled and hasn't been set up for use. The kidnappers talk about the daughter being inside the case, so Cecil moves over and opens it up. But this isn't the minister's daughter, this is Camilla. Cecil talks to her, learning that her father is Detective Jowd. Camilla details the events of the night of the murder five years ago. We know how this contraption was originally supposed to work. It was supposed to activate streamers and open a gift instead of killing someone. Jowd saw the results and took the fall for Camilla. Beauty senses Sissel again and levels the threat that the girl dies the next time that he is sensed. How do these kidnappers know about ghosts? Do they know about the powers of the dead? Lynn and Cecil try to convince the Justice Minister that his daughter is safe, but they fail to convince him. Inspector Cabanella walks in, Jowd by his side. Lynn asks why the inspector brought Jowd here instead of to the prison, but he refuses to give a legitimate response. Lynn accuses him of doing it to brag about his accomplishment, but he takes the accusation in stride. Jowd tells her to stand down. Cecil connects to his core so everyone can talk, revealing Camilla's kidnapping. Cecil mentions that he knows the truth of the murder five years ago, but Jowd still insists that it was him and that his daughter's suffering will finally end tonight. Cecil calls him out on this, claiming that the only person who will stop suffering after the execution is Jowd. Jowd still doesn't know what happened that day, but he does know that the contraption made an impossible move. The Cupid Archer was not built to rotate, but it did anyways, ending an innocent life. Jowd hid the gun in the music box and gave it to Lin for safekeeping. They can prove his innocence by finding the scorch marks on the gun left by the string tying it to the contraption. The only issue is that Camilla dropped the box in Tempsuk Park when she was kidnapped. Lynn heads to the park to search while Sissel tries to convince the Justice Minister to halt the execution. He travels along the phone lines to try and get the Minister's daughter to call. Unfortunately, the wrath of Wine Mom is still being brought down upon the apartment. When Sissel slides the phone over to the daughter, Wine Mom moves it to a higher shelf and drags her desk right next to the bed to keep an eye on her daughter. Sissel short circuits the light prompting her to light a chandelier. She somehow ignites the match with her posterior, probably because she's such a hard ass. Cecil traps her in the chandelier, raising her to the ceiling with a crank and dropping the phone so her daughter can make an important call. The Justice Minister has been ensured of his child's safety, but he still seems troubled. For some time now, the Minister has known about ghosts. In the special prison, all three cases have similarities. There was no motive, and something impossible happened. The curry lover had no way of knowing how to break into police headquarters. The musician had no way of knowing the national secrets that he sang. This led the police to consider the existence of a manipulator. Inspector Cabanella has been leading the charge on this manipulator investigating. Cecil mentions that his powers don't allow him to manipulate living beings, but the minister knows firsthand that someone out there does. One month ago, the justice minister was taken over by the manipulator and forced to sign and send off the execution order. It 
seems that the memories of someone who has been manipulated become hazy for the duration of their lack of control. Perhaps this is what happened to Lin. The minister ran from the problem by never acknowledging it, but the secret tore him apart. It's what took his wife and daughter away. The group reveals that manipulators are departed spirits, which baffles Cabanella. He's even more shocked when he finds out everyone in the room but him has been speaking with one of these ghosts. Cabanella quickly leaves, and Lin calls the office requesting backup from Sissel. One trip over the phone line later reveals the corpse of Temsic Park's guardian, crushed beneath a statue. Sissel goes back in time to save him, but his death is somewhat unusual. A massive stone statue completely altered directions and killed the park guardian instead of Camilla. If these are ghost tricks, someone has some seriously strong powers, far stronger than Sissel. In the ghost world, another spirit can be seen residing inside of a core. But who is it? It's Missile? Missile, the Pomeranian. This dog is more powerful than Sissel? As it turned out, Missile managed to escape the apartment and follow Camilla to the park, only to be run over by the kidnappers. When he woke up, he had the powers of the dead. Underneath him, something is radiating the same energy as Sissel's corpse. Missile rewound time and used a different set of ghost tricks to save Camilla. He can't manipulate objects like Sissel can, but he has a longer range and can swap objects of the same shape, hence our dead guardian. The two ghosts team up and maneuver a rugby ball into a barrel where it can be safely swamped. Back in the adjusted future, Missile, who is possessing a leaf, is blown away. The guardian of the park stands up and returns the music box to Lin. Shockingly enough, he seems to recognize her from the hostage incident ten years ago at the park. That night, the man threatening Lin was killed by a fragment of a fallen meteorite named Temsik. With even more information found, Cecil and Lin return to Jad with the music box. He pries it open revealing the gun and giving it to the minister to examine the scorch marks on the handle. This new evidence means that the execution order has been revoked. Cecil and Lin tell Jowd about the contraption in the basement of the junkyard office, which confuses him. He never told anyone about it, so there's no way it could have been replicated. Jowd mentions that he still blames himself for the death of the man that took Lin hostage ten years ago. He fired the warning shot that made the man panic and take Lin. For a very long time, he believed that his being blamed for his wife's murder was divine punishment for getting Lin involved. Jowd paints people so he never forgets them, and tonight, he finished his final portrait. The man in the park that day. Cecil panics. That painting was of him. But he only died tonight, and spirits disappear after the sun rises. Jowd tells the group that the man in the park was not named Cecil. So who is Cecil? The conversation is interrupted by a call from Inspector Cabanella, being held at gunpoint and relaying demands. The execution must still be carried out tonight, or Camilla dies. Cecil hightails it to Cabanella to save him, but finds only more confusion on the other side of the line. It's him, the man from the park. He calls the boss from the high-tech room at the start of the game. They seem to have some kind of bargain. So who is Sissel? It feels like the truth is farther away than ever. We're treated to another great use of forced perspective, as the camera pulls out from the high-tech room, revealing a submarine. Returning to our Sissels, the man from the park has nonchalantly killed Cabanella. Our Sissel goes to save him. The man from the park claims he's doing everything for revenge. Cabanella tries to remind him that he died due to a meteorite fragment, but the man slams his hand down on the furnace, insisting that he was murdered by everyone involved in the case. Lin, Cabanella, Jowd, everyone. He doesn't flinch as his hand begins to smoke from the heat. If Lin hadn't been there that night, the man would have no hostage. If Jowd hadn't chased him, he would have no need to run. And if Cabanella hadn't forgotten his gun in the interrogation room, he wouldn't have been able to threaten Lin in the first place. Cabanella calls him a self-centered moron and shoots him, but the man in red gets right back up. He manipulates the lamp to knock the gun into his own hand before killing Cabanella. Our dead inspector is now awake, but doesn't have all of his memories back. I guess we can listen to him babble as we try to save his life. Upon looking down, the basement is in shambles and the pigeon man is dead. He's conscious when Sissel gets to him and has all of his memories retained. The three proceed to work together to save this professor to see if this will open an opportunity to save Cabanella as well. The professor died from a bomb placed by the man in red. He and Cabanella were looking at the corpse after getting information about the manipulator being a spirit. The man in red sits up and antagonizes Cabanella, who is furious about Lin being manipulated. The man shrugs it off with a smirk and detonates the bomb next to the professor. 
Cabanella tries to save him, but is too slow. The blast breaks several bones in the process, leaving him unable to move on his own. This is where things get tricky. The man in red is clearly a manipulator. If Sissel does anything obvious, the man can undo it in an instant and will know that he has company. In the sewers below is a little barking leaf. Missile has had some fortunate timing. He uses his swapping abilities to replace the trapdoor under the professor's feet with a trash can lid, protecting him from the blast. With the professor alive and a new friend here to help, Cecil gets to work trying to save Cabanella. This puzzle was one of the most frustrating ones to deal with in my playthrough, but not because it was poorly designed. I'll walk you through it. You need to move Cecil through the ceiling and collaborate with Missile to swap something with the bullet. At one point, the man in red turns around. This is our chance to do something. I rotated the lamp to reach the helmet and knocked it over, hoping the noise wouldn't attract any attention. It did, forcing me to retreat. So now what can I do? I use the stool to move towards the right side of the screen and knock over this wool hat before bringing it back over. Missile swaps it with a book on the shelf and it now looks exactly like what you would expect a bullet to. When the bullet fires, all that's left is for Missile to swap it, except that this is what the bullet looks like. I'm a moron that forgot that bullets have casings. I guess this hard hat looks like the same shape, so hopefully that'll work. Okay, the hard hat was too hard, shocker, but what else can I do? Well, it turns out I had slightly bad timing the first time. I spent half an hour trying to figure out what to do here when I really just dropped the hard hat at the last section when the manipulator had already entered his turning animation, so he visually noticed it, not audibly. This time, with the hard hat gone, when the woolen hat falls from the bookshelf, it lands on the hook and the switch is far more successful. With Cabanella safe, it's time to question him. It seems his actions the last five years have all been to try and prove Jout innocent. He and the professor scoured the crime scene and recreated the machine to the best of their ability, which led to the discovery of the manipulator. He worked so hard to rise through the ranks so he could be in charge of the manipulator case and prove Jout's innocence. He took Lin into custody to keep her safe, and he took Jout to the minister's office instead of back to the prison in order to buy more time before the execution. Sissel questions the professor next. Ten years ago, he worked for the police as a medical examiner, but he couldn't perform an autopsy on the manipulator's corpse. Every time he cut into it with the scalpel, the skin healed instantly. Soon enough, the body disappeared. The only information that could be gathered was the knowledge of an unidentified radiation, the same type coming off of the Tempsic meteorite. Jowd and Lin appear in the room, with Jowd being given his freedom for the night to help with the case. He dons his old coat and uses a tracker gifted to him by Inspector Cabanella. The bullet the manipulator took has a tracker inside of it. Everyone splits up to find information, asking Sissel to stay by the phone so he's ready to travel at a second's notice. I'm going to interject here to give you your final, major spoiler warning. The case is about to unravel, so if you would like to play this game for yourself, skip to the timestamp on screen and in the description to avoid spoilers. Two hours before dawn, Sissel gets a call from Jowd. He's inside the submarine control room. The manipulator's corpse is sitting in the chair to the left, but it's unused. The boss steals the Tempsic fragment from the body and leaves. The control room is launched from the submarine to an unknown secondary location. With the phone having been moved to the floor before launch, Sissel is left in the submarine alongside Lin and Camila somewhere. It turns out that Missile is here too. The ghosts travel through the phone lines to find their friends. On the other side of the line, Lin is dead in a pool of water while Camila is panicking. Upon going back in time, we see that the manipulator took over Camila's body and tried to kill Lin. An explosion sounded out, with Lin jumping in to save her little roommate. Sissel travels through the phone, finding the source of the explosion. Before evacuation, the criminals armed a torpedo and aimed it at their own vessel. Sissel is able to possess the torpedo and disarm it, despite the objections of a little rat. He can't stop it from hitting the sub, but the damage isn't nearly as bad when it's not an explosive. Lin picks up Camila and everyone gets moving. The ship is still sinking and the entire sub rotates to the side, but the ghosts are able to get everyone to the door at the top. Lin and Sissel can't manage to get it open. A claw of some kind opens the door and yanks everyone through to safety. The claw is made of assorted junk, allowing it to reform itself into a more familiar form. This is the manipulator. He reveals that he knew about Sissel the entire time. After being betrayed, he doesn't know what to do anymore. Sissel reverts to the form of a soul, finally fully accepting that he doesn't know anything about who he is. The manipulator is not named Sissel. That's just a code name he used with the criminal organization to remain partially anonymous. 
He explains how Tempsic radiation works. If you die while exposed to the radiation, you are gifted the powers of the dead. Missile was exposed since he died in the park. Each power set is different and evolves over time. The manipulator used to only be able to manipulate small animals, but we've seen him do far more than that. It also suspends things in time. The reason the manipulator's corpse looks the same after a decade and cannot retain damage is because the Tempsic fragment constantly reverts it to its original state. The criminal organization wanted to wipe out everyone who knew about Tempsic to use the powers for themselves, while the manipulator just wanted revenge. They worked together to cause all the events of the game, but they had different goals. The manipulator wanted Lin locked up, but the hitman wanted her dead. She was looking into the Jowd case and could stumble upon the truth. Then, Sissel showed up, throwing a wrench into everyone's plans. Sissel asks why they ejected the control room instead of just taking the Tempsic fragment and leaving, but the manipulator doesn't know. Thankfully, Lin was gifted the tracker by Jowd before they split up, so the group can figure out exactly where the control room went. They can easily get there to ask Jowd for help if they launch the one remaining torpedo toward the room's coordinates. Missile, the manipulator, and Sissel hop onto the torpedo. Lin sends them to meet with Jowd. The ghosts hop from the cores in the torpedo to the cores in the floor of the control room, where Jowd is dead. We connect to Jowd's core and learn that the manipulator's name is Yomiel, and that the criminal sunk the submarine because they're afraid of someone that they can't control having such strong power. Yomiel finally agrees to answer some questions. He was a top-of-the-line systems engineer tasked with reorganizing the nation's most confidential information as part of a government project. Because of how high-profile the project was, many crimes were associated with it. Yomiel was arrested as a suspect for the work of a spy, being proven innocent six months after his death. He grew more and more bitter over time, wanting to take those associated with the crime down with him. He made a deal with an overseas organization. They would use his powers while he would get his revenge and live a new life in their country. He wanted a family and friends, but was met with betrayal. It seems the organization sent spies before ever initiating the deal, learning about Tempsic and deciding they wanted the powers for themselves. With most questions answered, the ghosts try and bring Jowd back to life. We learn that the assistant is a robot, therefore no living resources were sacrificed. Unfortunately, this robot has full control of the room, including the ceiling-mounted machine guns. There isn't a way to stop them, but Yomiel has a realization. The control room was launched away from the submarine, so none of the ghosts could get to Yomiel's corpse, so they couldn't go to four minutes before his death. The second that the fragment was removed, it became a normal body with a normal core. That's the only way to set things right, going back 10 years and stopping the tragedy from occurring. A young Lin sits baking a sweet potato in the park over a small fire. Yomiel and Jowd approach, with Jowd firing his warning shot. Yomiel grabs Lin. Jowd shoos away a black cat as the meteorite impacts, killing Yomiel. Now manipulating the timeline, Sissel waits for Yomiel to grab Lin before cranking the volume on her headphones, making her drop her potato. This creates a path to another potato sitting in a basket on the edge of the fountain. Using streams of water, Sissel maneuvers the potato into the air so Missile can swap it and then a lantern with the statue. This changes the trajectory of the Tempsic fragment through Jowd's leg and into the nearby bushes. Past Jowd fires a shot at Yomiel, but Missile swaps it for the sweet potato half. Yomiel is knocked back onto a spike attached to the lamppost. The impact makes the statue start to slide off, directly towards Lin. Present-day Yomiel has a final idea on how to save her. Sissel pushes the lantern into the air with one of the water fountain's nozzles. This allows Missile to switch the lantern with the statue. This buys just enough time for Yomiel to possess his own body and throw Lin to safety, crushing his legs. Jowd gives Lin a children's detective badge for being brave and sends her off to get help. Jowd and Yomiel have a chat while waiting for Lin. She returns with the black cat from earlier. It's unconscious, but doesn't seem to be hurt. Present day Yomiel smiles, commenting on how the cat's life just changed in a big way. He refers to the cat by name, Sissel. That's right, Sissel is the protagonist's real name. Sissel is Yomiel's cat. For 10 years, Yomiel's only company was the black cat from that night. After his death, he reached out unconsciously and shared Sissel's body. They lived together as a cat for some time as Yomiel slowly regained his memories. After those memories returned, Yomiel retrieved his body and rushed to the home of the most important person to him, his fiance. He was too late, unfortunately. She had already passed away next to a note reading, I'm coming to you, Yomiel. Yomiel named Sissel after his departed fiance, and they spent the next 10 years together. Sissel was happy during those years, but Yomiel wasn't. Sissel couldn't do anything about it but be there for him. As Yomiel's powers changed, his resentment deepened. He became more corrupted and cynical. 
He wanted things to go back to the way they were, and if he couldn't get that, he wanted the others who made him feel this way to feel exactly like he did, completely hopeless. When manipulating Lin's body, she managed to resist him. The first shot missed, going right through the bag holding Sissel. Being so close to the Tempsic fragment in Yomiel's chest, he gained the powers of the dead. Yomiel's body fell right in front of the bag, causing the identity confusion. Yomiel possessed the body of Sissel, but all power sets are different. Yomiel can't go to the past to save people, therefore, Sissel is permanently dead. Now that Yomiel's fate was changed in the past, the future will be erased and replaced with a new one. Only the memories of those present at this moment will remain. Forgiveness and thanks are spread, followed by the promise to never forget each other. The world is born anew. Or it will be in one second. Before Sissel can go back, he is stopped by Ray, who finally reveals his true identity through a story another version of tonight's events. Lin died at the hands of the hitman. They broke into her apartment, killing Missile and Camila. But Missile died in the aura of Yomiel's Tempsic fragment. He had the powers of the dead. With only the power to swap objects, Missile couldn't do much. He followed his killers and ended trapped in the control room with Yomiel. He went back to the world of ten years before, but was unable to stop the tragedy. So he waited. He waited for another chance at the same night in ten years' time. Missile had grown old and his powers changed and weakened. The reason he was able to teach Sissel about his powers was because he witnessed them during the original night. Sissel had no motivation to help anyone but himself, so he traveled through the phone lines and was never seen again. Missile waited those ten years in order to guide Sissel towards the path that would solve everyone's mysteries. This did involve one teeny white lie about disappearing at dawn. He needed Sissel to hurry so Yomiel's body wouldn't be trapped at the bottom of the ocean. With the final loose end tied up, Sissel is sent to the new timeline.
Sissel was in the bushes where the Temsic fragment ricocheted after going through Jowd's leg. His body showed no damage because the fragment regenerated him. His body is in the same state as Yomiel's used to be, and now he can happily live as a cat alongside his friends. What? a game. I'm not gonna lie, replaying it and writing this script in such a short time was insanely draining. The story is crazy elaborate, but they somehow tied up every single loose end. All the characters were likable, even the ones that I poked fun at. There was great humor, genuinely emotional moments, and all of the animations were beautiful. Seriously, I am never gonna get sick of how fluid and stylized everything is. And just look at the character portraits. Absolutely beautiful. The gameplay is still up there as one of, if not my favorite puzzle game of all time. There are so many intricate details and creative mechanics to work with that every time you solve a puzzle, it's very satisfying. You truly feel accomplished each time you complete one. This is one of the best games that I have ever played, and I'm incredibly excited for people to give the remaster a shot in June. Thanks for watching, and thank you for 20,000 subscribers. I hope to see you all again. I'm gonna go pass out.